kingdom is ruled over by the Kabaka, Mutesa II, the 33rd Kabaka who receives the visitors. He then introduces them to his ministers. After that, he introduces them to the Speaker of the House and other officials. A guard of honor, mounted by the Buganda police, presents arms as the Duke takes the royal salute. The Duke and the Kabaka return towards the steps of Parliament. A court dancer with a shield and spear performs in welcome, and the Kabaka's drums beat out a royal rhythm as the whole party enters Blangi. The Kabaka's standard moves in the warm breeze. This important ceremony is attended by the Governor, the Prime Minister of Uganda, and many notables. The Kabaka speaks. It is an unusual honor for a senior captain to welcome a junior captain, both listed in the report. Your kind welcome to me and to my wife has given us the greatest pleasure. And I would like to say at once how glad we are to be with you this morning in this historic assembly. You have made us feel at home and we shall not easily forget the warmth and friendliness with which you have received us. Afterwards, the Kabaka gives a luncheon for hundreds of people at his palace, Dwekobe. Their royal highnesses are there, and the Duke mounts the steps to salute the crowds to the music of drums playing traditional music. At the same time, the Prime Minister entertains 250 overseas delegates and guests to a luncheon. In his speech, Mr. Bote says, We have no illusions as to the difficulties that confront us. We are resolved to face our difficulties with courage and reason. He goes on to say, We shall be glad to stand beside all men of goodwill in an honest attempt to seek peace on earth. On the outskirts of Kampala is the Uganda Museum. Uganda places great importance on education. The Prime Minister comes to open a new wing and says, It is my great privilege, and I'm happy that I have been given this honor to declare this pavilion today open. Thank you very much. Uganda means to use every technological weapon in its efforts to improve the country's economy. Such displays as this remind people that there have always been changes, that life itself is change, and that Uganda will change in the future. To improve our country, the people will have to adapt new ideas and new methods, and this will need intensive and liberal education. Later in the afternoon, the Kabaka entertains over 2,000 people to a garden party. His Highness strolls among the guests in the back of the palace as they enjoy themselves among the flowers. Uganda is one of the four kingdoms during its stewardship in Uganda. Under the leadership of our 37-year-old Prime Minister, Mr. Milton Obote, Uganda is about to attain her independence. The great day approaches. The independence celebrations will start tomorrow in Uganda. The kingdoms have various relationships with the central government. According to their agreements, but they are all part of our country. They all have their share in the celebrations. Five rulers and ceremonial heads have come to the capital to represent their people and thus give proof of the harmony that reigns in the land. Here is the Umugabe of Ankole. 
the borders of his country match with those of Rwanda. The Mukam of Bunyoro comes from his kingdom which lies between Acholi, Lango and Buganda. The Mukam of Toro has come from his kingdom in the west. His land is separated from the Congo by the snow-clad mountains of the moon. The elected ruler, the Chebazing of Busoga, is present. In his territory is the source of the White Nile. Tonight is the night of independence, and the whole country is ready with the lights and bonfires. Independence ceremony takes place before a crowd of 60,000 attending the tattoo. Next on UBC, brought to you by Keep the Lights On. Use Airtel money to pay for all your Yaka bills conveniently. Open the My Airtel app to buy Yaka units. Airtel money, simple, secure, borderless. A very warm welcome and a very good evening to UBC News Tonight. It is the 8th day of October 2021. I'm Lorraine Masika Kazimoto and Muhammad Mogalu on sign language. We start off with our first headlining story this evening. President Yori Museveni has commended religious leaders for the following for following the good path of harmony in Uganda. Museveni, who was speaking at the 23rd National Prayer Breakfast held at State House under the theme Responsibility Before God and Man, said the National Resistance Movement, NRM, had to reject other parties with sectarian beliefs and follow in the line of God. The National Prayer Breakfast hosted by the Speaker of Parliament was attended by top government officials and the clergy. We have the details. Every year, Parliament organizes the National Prayer Breakfast ahead of the 9th October Independence Day anniversary celebrations. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, the interfaith annual event has been held at State House to limit the number of physical participants and Ugandans fall on mainstream and social media. In his keynote address, Right Reverend Johnson Trinomu Juni, Bishop of West Ankle Diocese, urged the faithful to promote what pleases God. 
Don't forget at any moment that he is our chief employer, as I said. Protect the vulnerable. Fight for the oppressed. Promote justice and equity. Love and care about the needy. The Lord shall be pleased with you and shall reward your goodness to his people. God is just. And I can derive from, from the Bible that the, the justice of God is either retributive or remunerative. He rewards the faithful. He also punishes sinners. Addressing the gathering, President Museveni said Uganda will never return to the religious conflicts that affected Uganda's development in the past between 1877 and 79. And then 1879, the Catholics came. Father Lord Lauder and another one, Brother Amiens. Within a very, this is 1877-79, but you can imagine by 1890, after just 13 years, Christians were fighting one another here, and Muslims. Total confusion. I don't know how our people could do, agree to be manipulated like that, killing one another. The, the Catholics were called Bafaransa, that they were French. <laughs> because you are Catholic, you are French. The Protestants were called Ingereza, that they were English. And the Muslims were called Mohammedans. He said this was part of their struggle to bring total peace and harmony. And, and actually, this is part of the NRM struggle. We rejected this. We said, we can't accept this. This is wrong. We rejected it politically. That's why in 1965, some of us left the old parties, left uh, DP, left UPC, forgot about Kabaka. We, we, we never belonged to Kabaka Yaka. Kabaka Yaka was just especially confused. And we started uh, the new line, the line of Jesus, actually, in politics. Despite of the undertaking of a good path exhibited by the Interreligious Council of Uganda, President M7 says many countries are still engaged in conflicts under the guise of working for God. In Yemen, in Lebanon, in Iraq, all those countries, much of the problem is that confusion in, pe in people's heads when they say they are working for God, when in fact they are off the point doing other things which are anti-people. And I, I thank the message because the message seems now to, to, to be coming. Even the Interreligious Council, I don't know how you formed it. Did you learn from NRM or you had formed it before? Speak of Parliament Jacob Olanya, working closely with his deputy Anita Monk Annet, pledged hoping government deliver on its promises. Your Excellency, the parliament that you will have now will not be like any parliament you have worked with before. It is our commitment to help you as a parliament, being head of the executive and head of the country, to help you in the service of our people. We will not lose focus, we will not lose sight, we will keep our eyes on the ball that whatever we do must bring reward, must resonate with the lives of the ordinary people. Present are the prayers were top government officials, security chiefs, heads of religious leaders, among others. We commit our nation into your hands as we move forward into the new wave of glory that you are releasing to us. Please continue to walk with us and be our God and allow us always to be your people. We praise and bless you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Bernard Higa, UBC News.
Key policymakers and implementers from central and local government congregated in Mbale city to deliberate on issues affecting service delivery. The Prime Minister, Robin Anabanja, presided over the opening ceremony. The ceremony was held at Wash and Wills Hotel in Mbale city. This meeting, codenamed Prime Minister's Toktik and Regional Stakeholders Engagement, was organized by the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit, PMDU. It was called to evaluate success and failures in implementation of activities in the project areas. This project covers 22 focus districts. The Prime Minister's Delivery Unit, PMDU, was formed in 2015 as part of the drive to improve performance and implementation of the National Development Plan. The Prime Minister cautioned delegates against laziness. She said there should be no excuse in service delivery but push for results. The government is committed to continue building and sustaining capacities for service delivery as a national priority. We request you to support it in your respective districts. On this note, like my peers said, Professor, we must roll out this program throughout the country. We shall look for money so that all parts of the country get the feel of this program. The PMDU has since 2016 piloted a unique service delivery method in the respective project districts. The purpose is to realize improved returns on public investments in health, education, and infrastructure. The State Minister for Karamoja Affairs, Agnes Nandutu, called for a concerted effort from all stakeholders to deliver quality service to the people. I would like to welcome you to the region right on our Prime Minister. You are very much welcome. This is your second time to come to the region. You are first in Sronko district and the war in, in Vulambuli district where many of the landslide victims have been resettled. And we thank you for the good work that you did there. You found the people there, they had no land to, to do agriculture. But when you arrived there, you instructed, they are very happy. They have now engaged into agriculture. Thank you so much. The head of the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit, Professor Ezra Suruma, spoke highly about the parish development model. He said it was a well-thought-out program that should be supported by all leaders, particularly those at the grassroots level. We want to be sure that every citizen, every household has access to basic needs, to basic infrastructure, and is assisted to have an adequate income for basic needs. Later, the Prime Minister presented awards to the best performing project districts. Sironko District was declared the overall winner. The three-day regional workshop was held under the theme strengthening the mechanisms for quality, effective, and efficient service delivery. Doreen Nasasera, reporting for UBC News. The Deputy Chief of Defence Forces, Lieutenant General Peter Elweru, assured the Karamojong that government is doing everything possible to secure lasting security stability of the region and peace. Elweru was, uh, was addressing top security officials from Kabong and Karenga districts. The meeting was held in Kabong town to see how peace can be achieved. Alakara. For the past month, Karamoja, who's been experiencing my player effects of insecurity and cut rustling, with the region sliding to vulnerability, President Museveni announced additional military hardware and human resource to combat small pockets of insecurity emerging in the region. Though at the moment, all efforts are directed at stabilizing the region and returning relative peace. The Deputy CDF Lieutenant General Peter Elweru has met with security leaders in the districts of Karenga and Kabong to emphasize the President's protracted move to stabilize the region. Interact with the leadership here 
together with the security, looking into the challenges they are facing in terms of security. However, Elweru has sounded a warning to the local defense unit deserters to bring back government belongings before the pardon elapsed. Whatever they have taken, our uniform and work, they can bring them back. And uh, we have no problem with them. For all, they were meant to protect the community. If they decided to go back to the community, we have no problem with them. So please assure them that nobody will punish them. Here leaders are challenged by the porous borders and limited security access roads to border points. However, the Deputy 3rd Division Commander, Brigadier Ezekiel Okolong, is optimistic that the menace will soon be a matter of the past. Yeah, the forces are not there, so they still have to go away. Mm -hmm. For us, fighting vehicles, so far we have about 40 already on the ground. 40. Kabong has got five as I'm talking now. Nevertheless, Lieutenant General Elweru promised that government is doing all possible to restore peace in the fragile region of Karmoja. With so many groups, these ones cannot disorganize us. They cannot manage us. We are yielding capacity and within the next few months, we are going to do everything possible to make sure that peace prevails in this whole region. The Deputy 3rd Division Commander Brigadier Okalong is worried about the role of alleged witch doctors in the skyrocketing cattle rights in the region. But Lieutenant General Elwero wants the alleged witch doctors brought on board if their role is instrumental in restoring peace in the region. These people are busy tearing children apart. Mm. They are tearing children halfway, taking it. It is a children life. I hope I tell you about that. People have been killing animals since the eighteen times. A lot of sacrifices have been done and we are ignoring. When we come to the meeting, we talk about politics, we talk about the military, we talk about the police. We are talking about the witch doctor who is in the village there. There are very many witch doctors in the village who are encouraging. That, that, that witch doctor is encouraging. Let's engage with this group. Let's help them. Let's bring them on board. Let them be part of our security architecture. Because with them, on our side, then this was of nowhere to go. Because they, they are, these ones are the eyes of that group. The meeting was attended by UPDF officials from the 3rd Division, Uganda Police and Prisons, civil and political leaders from Kabong and Karenga districts. Report compiled by Maureen Eager. The floods ravaging the districts of Kaberamaido, Kalaki and Serere emanating from the rising water levels of Lake Kyoga have cut off residents in the affected districts to access essential commodities from neighboring communities. Now locals have to choose between risking to the flooded roads that harbor crocodiles and trekking long distances to access basic needs from other markets. The hardship came to light during a familiarization tour of government projects by the State Minister for Teso Affairs. Details in this report. Karaki District is among the three districts in Teso subregion that has been adversely affected with floods arising from the increased water levels of Lake Choga and that have destroyed many of the feeder roads. This has made it possible for residents to access their daily essential needs from the nearby markets and also health services from nearby health centers. If someone is sick, there's no way of really, really do some help to that person. Going to the other side of Kalaki is very far, but from here it's very near, if the road was really okay. The problem is compounded by the absence of earth-moving equipment at the district engineering department to ease the fixing of the destroyed roads. The only grade that we have, that we received from the mother district, uh, came when it was grounded, the engine was taken to Bugembe, uh, for repairs. Uh, it's now two years that we, the engine hasn't come back. So as we are right now, we don't have the equipment. The district is now seeking for more than 2 billion shillings to rehabilitate more than 250 kilometers of roads that have been ravaged by the floods. But we need at least 20 million shillings per kilometer. Mm -hmm. 
adequately rehabilitate. With the availability of the funds, the first priority will be fixing of the broken bridges that have been washed away before the whole exercise is rolled out in the entire district. As we discussed from the committee, we need to we need to spot out the swamps because the funds are not enough. And uh, when we look at how things have been operating, they have been working on the roads and then they skip the swamp and then they go to the other side. Of which, as the chairperson right now, I see like we need to strategize in a way that we, we, we map those particular swamps and then we plan, we cost accordingly. In Serere district, the situation of roads is almost similar as the woman member of parliament who doubles as state minister for animal husbandry and fisheries, Helen Adoa, expresses her concern over the flooded roads in her district. We have about five roads that you cannot go through to another sub county because of roads, I mean because of floods and a bad uh, kind of uh, construction. So, so the next day, so help us. I'm not racking so since we are we are full of water. Ne? I'm not racking so. Minister of State for Teso Affairs, Dr. Kenneth Ongalo Obote, who was on his familiarization tour and inspection of government projects, assured the residents that government is aware of the impassable roads in the region. So I think you can appreciate the anger that uh, sometimes people feel, the locals especially, when they are faced with that kind of situation, day in, day out, when they have to transport their sick ones. But our coming here has really been to reassure people that the government is aware and uh, that these roads will be worked on. However, Ongola Obote blamed the disaster on human activities in the wetlands that have destroyed part of the ecosystem leading to the flooding of the roads in Teso. Joseph Okou, UBC. On October the 8th, it will strictly be 59 years of self-rule for Uganda Kingdom from the whims of the British rule. However, there are controversies and mischiefs on the authenticity of Buganda's independence within one sovereign state called Uganda that obtained its independence on October 9th, 1962, a day after Buganda obtained its independence on the 8th of October. Now, to shed more light on the controversies, to get the facts right, UBC's Nasil Luwama spoke to historian and former Katikiro of Buganda, OHTWA Dan Mulika, to weigh on the mystery of Buganda's independence before Uganda. Take a look. In the build-up to Uganda's independence in 1962, it is alleged that on several occasions, Buganda, a kingdom within the British protectorate of Uganda, kept on demanding the British colonialists to give Buganda independence as a fully fledged nation. But the British declined. So it, the British were escaping Buganda who had a case between them and them. Because it was being the, the British were handing over to Buganda its full powers according to the past agreements and allowed it to join Uganda on the 9th. Ugandans, especially the youth, are pondering on the authenticity of Uganda's independence of 8th October 1962 within the sovereign state Uganda, which it is part. For the sake of saying that we are, because we are still now fighting all, all nations are fighting together to see whether we could be, we could put up a good Uganda. But there is nothing very much because Uganda is under custody. The Uganda Independence Day festivities were held at Kololo ceremonial grounds where the British Union Jack was lowered to raise the Uganda flag on October 9, 1962, signifying the end of the British colonial rule. Someone may ask where the Buganda Independence Day celebrations were held and what did the British surrender to Buganda Kingdom? The Duke of Kent, who, gave, who, gave, who represented the Queen here, went to Ruviri, handed over the independence to Buganda, and the Queen's flag went down, Buganda's flag went up.
Then when Buganda the following day on the 9th went to Kololo, we joined the arrest. Britain has on several occasions denied reports of alleged Uganda independence, though a concession to make Sir Frederick Walgembe Mtesa II, the Kabako of Uganda at the time, the first ceremonial president of independent Uganda, was made, but on condition that he had no executive powers and that the ceremonial presidency was to be rotation among the kingdoms at the time. The executive powers were vested in the prime minister was just, you know, scheming and manipulation among the those who went to discuss in a London conference the poorest constitution which has ever been written, where you don't have exit. Some literature believes that the Ugandan independence on the 9th of October was a big cost to the Buganda Kingdom. Buganda lost because it, was, it had a lot of autonomy handling its own. We were handling its schools hospitals, even the farming policies, economy-wise. Now, we are waiting for central government to direct each and everything, which is not possible. The relevance of Uganda independence hangs in question while analyzing the components of a sovereign independent state. We celebrate with our fellow Ugandans that we have this artificial independence because we are still not free. Why guns are here? Why people are dying if we are free? It should be remembered, by 9th October 1962, Uganda got her independence from the British, and by 1967, the Prime Minister with executive powers, Sir Apollo Milton Oboti, abolished all kingdoms in Uganda. The ceremonial president, Sir Edward de Mutesa II, fled to exile and Uganda became a republic in 1967 under the Pigeon Hollow Constitution. But because the constitution of 62 was overthrown, up to now people have never gained their chance of making a constitution by their will. That marked the end of cultural leaders meddling in national politics to date, though under a different legal regime. Abdul Nasir Luwama for UBC. All right, UBC News tonight takes a very short break, but we return with business news. Today in history. Former President of Uganda, Godfrey Binaisa, addressed the 34th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York, America. In this session, Binaisa expressed his dismay at the way the world body watched in what he called embarrassing silence as human rights in Uganda were violated under Amin's regime. He also met then President of America, Jimmy Carter, who promised to extend $21 million in aid. I smile when I think of you, Uganda, my home, my home. I dance when I look at you, Uganda, my home, oh, my Uganda. I know with you I'll always stay forever. I know, I know, because I feel that we belong together, my home. MTN, we look forward to starting another exciting journey together to grow our home, Uganda.
vaccinated today so we can get closer to the normal way of life. Echa COVID-19, chicha kugwa. Friday from Airtel. Buy or gift. Buy or give. Get freaky too. Dial star 149 star 10 hash to load a freaky Friday bundle for you to enjoy the best offers on voice and data. To buy a bundle for friends and family, dial star 149 star 10 star 5 hash. Freaky Friday with Airtel. Buy or gift a bundle today. Dial star 149 star 10 hash to get started. Airtel, the smartphone network. Welcome back from the break. And now into business news. Nexus Green Limited has launched the first solar-powered irrigation and water systems in Mukono District. The system will be used to harvest water that shall be used to supply farmers in uphill areas to support agriculture. The project is financed by both UK and Uganda governments. Take a look. <coughs> Senior government officials and the British High Commission have witnessed the groundbreaking of the first phase of the solar irrigation scheme project in Impu Montenjeru Town Council, Mukono District. The project is implemented by Nexus Green, a company that specializes in solar energy, financed by both UK and Uganda. We are also supervising and monitoring to ensure that this loan of 95 million euros delivers on the scope on which it was designed for. The scheme is able to produce 19.8 kilowatts of power from 60 solar panels used to pump water to people's gardens. Based on the amount of water I'm getting out of the ground, where I'm going to pump it, then I determine the amount of energy that I need. And that's how you determine the number and the size of solar panels. And we're going to do this for each and every single site that we're going to do. Residents in the area are excited of the water supply to enable them engage consistently in agriculture. Last season we lost. All the maize died a natural death. <laughs> and the beans also they all died. So, you know, so with this there is hope. That uh, you know, they want to be in dead things in our country. And she actually has gone from um, 10 million shillings per annum to 480 million shillings per annum. And that is going to be her forecast, her first year of using solar irrigation as her forecast. So you can see the magnitude on how the, the solar irrigation has such a massive impact from a commercial side. The use of this technology is said to be environmentally friendly and a solution to global warming. Places the temperature has already risen too high and some crops you cannot plant anymore. So you have to already adapt and plant different crops uh, as well as a uh, question of the water. So I think this is very important when we see the sharing of technology and I hope when we have the big conference on climate change next month uh, in the UK that uh, Uganda will bring lots of examples like this of where this kind of change is happening and really making a change in livelihoods uh, for people. And then we're also working with the Ministry of Agriculture as well on some of the changes of agricultural practices that we will need to see, whether that's in coffee, whether it's in maize production. And then this is all about value add. You know, I'm acutely aware that, you know, Uganda needs to create jobs. We have a lot of young people in this country. We need to make sure we're providing good, quality, sustainable jobs for their future. At least 700 facilities are to be installed across the country in three years. Farmers will be able to apply in order to be part of the project. Ivan Kahua, UBC News in Mukono District. All right. Now into a little bit of sports. Uh, the Uganda's under-20 women's football team has defeated Kenya 3-1 on the day and 
three aggregate to qualify uh, to the third round of the under 20 World Cup qualifier. This and much, much more in our 10 o'clock bulletin. Do not miss. All right, UBC News Tonight has come to an end, but let's first take a look at tonight's headlines. leaders and peace a harmony in the country head teacher sentenced to life in prison of a sodomy in sports cranes upbeat about Sunday game after beating a Mavubi 1-0 and Uganda's under 20 women beats Kenya 3-1 gear up for third round of the World Cup qualifier I would like to thank you so much for your company this evening, but do join us for our second edition of UBC News tonight at 10 o'clock. My name is Laureen Masika Kazimoto and Mohamed Mugalu. We'll see you then. We'll leave you with tonight's weather forecast with Daphne. Intervals are prevailed in most parts of our country, though some areas had cloudy conditions in the morning hours, but then later in the afternoon, cloudy conditions, with some few areas having showers prevailed in our country, especially the northern, eastern, and areas around Lake Victoria. According to the report that received today, Bududa reported the highest amount of rainfall of 65.3 millimeters. Masindi, we had 51.3 millimeters. Gulu, we had 20.9 millimeters. And then Toro, we had 12.1 millimeters. Check on the satellite image over Africa, it shows there is a low pressure center that is over the horn of Africa. It is taking away most of the moist winds that would have come towards our country, and this has led to a slight reduction of rainfall in some parts of Uganda. Though we are still benefiting from the local effect, from the effect coming from the lakes, forests, and swamps that we have around us. For tomorrow, we are expecting to start the day with a sunny intervals in the northern and eastern part of Uganda. In the central around Lake Victoria and western part of the country, we are expecting showers. Later in the afternoon, we are expecting showers in most parts of Uganda, apart from some few areas like central Uganda, where we are expecting sunny intervals. Temperatures expected to rise to 30 degrees Celsius in the northern part of the country, 29 in the eastern and northern part of Uganda, some few areas in the northern part of the country, around Lake like Victoria, we're expecting temperatures to rise to 27. Chigazi Highlands, we're expecting temperatures to rise to 22 degrees Celsius. Going to some few areas like Nairobi, we're expecting showers, and also in New York. In some areas like London, Dubai, and Moscow, we're expecting sunny intervals with temperatures rising to 11 degrees Celsius in Moscow. That's what, that's what we had from the weather. So I'm Daphne Kawasita from Uganda National Meteorological Authority. For more information about that, don't hesitate to dial star 255 star 85 hash or check on our website for more information. Happy Independence Day tomorrow. The Board, Management and Staff of the Electricity Regulatory Authority era congratulate His Excellency the President of Uganda, General Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, our valued stakeholders and all the people of Uganda on this auspicious day when Uganda marks her 59th independence anniversary. The Electricity Regulatory Authority, the power subsector supervisor, is committed to the attainment of affordable electricity supply for all Ugandans for socio-economic transformation. Long live Uganda! To get a hold of freedom, oh,
my message to all Ugandans on this 59th occasion as we celebrate the anniversary of Ugandans' independence, I want to invite all Ugandans, and especially people from northern Uganda, to embrace peace and hard work. The peace and hard work will help us to generate our own economy, to generate our own transformation to a better life. I want to thank the leaders of this country. I want to thank the NRM government, our president, Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, for leading us through the challenges and we register some successes. In northern Uganda, especially after the wars, there was abject poverty compared to the rest of the country. And now there has been some progress made through various interventions. And I also want to thank the people of northern Uganda for having embraced the government programs. But I. I say that uh, we should do more. When new programs are introduced, we should take time to understand it and own it and work with it for our own betterment, for our own transformation. Please avoid reckless activities, over drinking, activities that can lead you into accidents, which can lead you into fights, which can lead you into criminal tendencies. May you celebrate this 59th year of independence in peace. God bless you. First and foremost, I would like to congratulate all Ugandans upon the 59th uh, anniversary of our independence, long live Uganda. As we all are aware, it has been a long journey since we received our independence, beginning with the years of turmoil. Since 1986, the people of Uganda have been in peace throughout the country and a lot of development has taken place. To date, most of the activities of the economy of our country are in the hands of Ugandans, including myself. And we have dominated all sectors, namely trade, which includes import and export of commodities, we have dominated real estate, which includes building of commercial and residential properties. We have dominated industries, which includes manufacturing. We have dominated farming, which includes uh, cash crops, poultry, uh, cattle keeping, to mention. We are also in the financial sectors like forex bureaus, microfinance institutions, banks, to mention. We are in the dominance of so many sectors of our economy. This has partly been due to the peace ushered in by the NLM government since 1986 and we thank the government for the good climate that has enabled us to develop our cities. management and staff of Uganda Bureau of Statistics. We wish to congratulate the President of the Republic of Uganda, 
His Excellency General Yoweri Kaguta Tibuhaburu Museveni.